Here today, gone tomorrow. Once upon a time, these were state-of-the-art devices for recording pictures and sound. Now, they're history. And so are many of the archives and much of the culture they were supposed to save. Our cover story is reported by David Pogue of the New York Times. Lydia Robertson is a filmmaker, but you've probably never seen okay. her first um, movie, the one a, she made in high this school. Horrible. It's called The Chicken Lady, a horror comedy. It's the most ridiculous film ever made. It might be one of the worst films ever made, but we learned a lot, and that was the point. Trouble is, she hasn't seen it either. By 1986, when I was graduating from New York University Film School, you couldn't get these machines to play it back on. So I have had no way to play it. I've not seen it since it was made. Her tapes are fine, but the machines that can play them don't exist anymore. In other words, her movie is a victim of data rot. My data is unreadable. Data rot affects computers, too. Over the years, both the hardware and the software programs become obsolete and are abandoned. Just ask biotech worker Bill LaVia, who can no longer open his slideshow presentations from 10 years ago. The program is uh, uh, Aldous Persuasion, and it was a slideshow presentation program. Uh, they basically went out of business because PowerPoint took over that marketplace. In fact, so many computer formats have come and gone, they could fill a museum. And they do, the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley. There's a Pez Museum, a Barbie Museum, a Mustard Museum. Why wouldn't you preserve the computer, which is maybe the most influential piece of technology in the last hundred years? Dag Spicer is the museum's senior curator. This is the world's first hard disk. Uh, invented in 1956 in San Jose, it weighs 1,000 pounds and holds 5 megabytes. Oh my gosh. Now this, this iPod, the hard drive in it is about this big and it holds 10,000 songs. How many, how many songs would, would, uh, would an iPod with this in it hold? Well, this would hold one song. And, and it would be a real pain to carry around. Yeah, you need big batteries. <laughs> At a computer museum, you can't miss the point that sooner or later, every recording format eventually gets left in the dust. In fact, these days, new formats are coming faster and faster, and each one expires faster than what came before it. There's a consensus of that is that the ability to store more and more data, the data itself, has become less and less reliable. Don Menerick is an archivist at the New York Public Library. He's been working on preserving some historic 1968 audio interviews with rock stars. Some of the people on them are Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, Frank Zappa, The Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, Phil Everly, um, it's really all over the place. The Beach Boys are a creative act, you know, and that's not because you're here and you're standing here. That's a creative act. It's a, some kind of new thing that happened on this coast, you know, out here. Before In 1996, that, the library tried to rescue those 30-year-old recordings by transferring them to fresh, brand-new tapes. But now, less than 12 years later, those tapes are already significantly degraded. The tape actually physically will shed against the head of the tape player until it's unplayable. So you're saying that the original tapes are actually holding up better than the 1996 transfer? Yeah. But not everyone is unhappy about data rot. An entire industry has sprouted up to help you recover your old recordings and data. You can buy do-it-yourself gadgets that convert your old audio cassettes, records, and slides into digital formats. We take old video, old film, uh, old audio, and even old data, and we migrate it. Or, if you have more money than time, you could send them away to a company that does the job for you, like Vidipax in New York City. Sam Verga is the director of marketing. We restore, and then we make something else out of it. And in today's world, most of that means a digital product. From CBS News headquarters in New York, Walter Cronkite. Hey, Walter Cronkite, dude, CBS News. Yes, yes, a very old version, too. Well, why are you doing CBS News' tape? Why aren't they doing it? Well, they probably would like to do it if they had a working machine. I'm sure they would do it. They Unfortunately, have... they don't. They don't have this machine. That's correct. But you have one. Yes, we have actually eight of them. Half the challenge is just keeping all those antique machines running. This is actually called a wire recorder. And this is dating back to about the 1950s. It looks like monofilament fishing line, and that's actually embedded with an audio signal. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. It's Kennedy. 
Yes, it is. It's an inaugural speech. This is Kennedy's inauguration. So, so are you telling me you actually get customers now and then sending you spools of wire and saying that turning this into a CD? Absolutely. Of course, if you're worried about your old recordings, look at the bright side. Some people have much bigger collections to worry about, like the Library of Congress. 56 million manuscripts, the world's largest collection of movies and recorded sound, 6 million maps, a million and a half rare books. Laura Campbell is the chief information officer for the Library of Congress. Since the early 90s, she's overseen a multi-million dollar effort to digitize the library's most precious holdings, both to preserve them and to make them available to the public on the internet. Uh, really what we're trying to do is to save our collective memory, to be able to pass on the human record of our time. And so every day, in back rooms in Washington, D.C., Library employees are painstakingly digitizing the library's 16 million photos, prints, and posters, one at a time. The most famous photograph in the whole Library of Congress? Wow. She's called Migrant Mother. I've seen this. Their boss is Helena Zinkham, acting chief of prints and photographs. And this is one of our favorite items in the collection, where Abraham Lincoln is running for president in 1860. Actually, this is about a guy named Abram Lincoln. True. They ran out of a little bit of space on that line in the flag, and so they left out the H. <laughs> so these are 100 years old, more than 100 years old. Yes, these are going on to 200, yeah. 200 years old, OK. And what? how are you choosing an electronic format that you can guarantee will still be viewable 200 years from now? Well, we stick with the standard, uh, which for photographic copying, they call it a TIFF file, T-I-F-F. -F. Okay. And we have actually had to migrate these files already. There's that word again, migration. The more you talk to data rot experts, the more often you hear it, and the more you realize that converting your old recordings to digital formats is only the beginning. It's a hard drive last five years. Um, you know, the, the low range of CDs and DVDs, uh, longevity is five years. So um, the basic lesson is look after your own data and make sure that you take steps to keep it moving onto new formats about once every 10 years. In the digital age, migration is the only chance we have of preserving our recordings and our files. But you can do it. Just follow these three easy steps. You convert whatever you can afford to to digital. Store your tapes and films in a cool, dry place and above all, remain vigilant. As you now know, every 10 years or so, you're going to have to transfer your important memories to whatever format is current at the time. Because there never has been, and there never will be, a recording format that lasts forever.